Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Nico Tilly, working for Delft University, doing my PhD in livable fossil energy free cities. And I also do my studies in the city of Rotterdam, and there we use a lot of indicator tools to actually uh, accelerate sustainable development. So um, what we did uh, in, in the past few years is that we said, look, we, uh, we want to become the sustainable, attractive city but first let us uh, decide to uh, to know how do we perform ourselves. So um, what what is the benchmark where we are standing as a city? Because if you can't measure what we are doing, we can't manage it uh, in a way. It's, and it's nothing different than kids going to school and getting their marks. Um, but that's, that's an uh, easy thing going on. Um, so what we first did was we, we got uh, flooded by demand from organizations to give data about city rankings and to see where Rotterdam was standing in this way. So what we first did is actually make a comparison between all many city rankings around, like here the Quality of Life Index, the Livability Index, the green lane index and all these kind of uh, the Siemens green city index the European green capital etc so what we did we defined 12, 20 studies and 12 of them we found interesting enough or they provided us actually with enough data to be used in a um, in a study uh, so it ranges from uh, rankings worldwide to rankings in the Netherlands and actually what we did, we looked at the high scores in each ranking. And what we see down here below is some cities which quite often are in the high rankings, like Portland, San Francisco, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Vancouver, uh, Helsinki, and many others, uh, Vienna. And we said, okay, what are these cities doing and how do we perform overall in these rankings? Um, but, but also we ask ourselves the question, why do we get involved in rankings as a city? Well, first of all, the main issue was that we want to have feedback on the policies we are doing. So if we have a policy, is it gaining, uh, is it solving effect? Is it uh, having the effect we want? Because for us, it's a kind of learning tool. Um, another thing is that if we score well on a certain ranking as a city or score bad on a certain ranking, it can actually give us data or uh, um, when we apply for money, we can say, look, we did so-and-so in these rankings, so please can you help us with that, or can you uh, actually uh, uh, give money to, to be even better. Uh, and also sometimes it's, of course, just for good press, because many of these rankings do very well in um, uh, communication. So when it's in the newspaper, it says, look, we scored uh, fourth on this ranking, then it helps the city a bit. But the last thing is a bit, well, it's not very scientific, but it's a fact of life. Uh, we actually uh, deal with it in the city. So one of the rankings we joined was the uh, Siemens Green City Index, and it deals with a lot of planet issues, as I call them, like energy, buildings, transport, and all the environmental aspects. Um, well, we didn't do too well on CO2 and energy. That's because we have many oil refineries in the port. But uh, anyway, it's just... Um, so when we look at the Green City Index score, we scored number 13 out of 30 uh, for land use as well. Uh, but for instance, when we look at the European Green Capital, and it's number, in 2014, we scored number four and number one for land use among 30 other cities. So it's very difficult to compare these rankings. It's a bit of apple and pear, and we've seen in previous presentations that this is uh, the case. So one of the ranking systems we came across was uh, actually the Global Cities Indicator Facility from University of Toronto and United Nations and World Bank. Uh, and actually, it's because we liked it because it's not a ranking. It's a tool which uh, helps us to, um, to look at our own policy and to see if we are doing well. Um, overall, we compared all the rankings. We looked at the top three cities and what they were doing well, and we see that they do well in economy, green buildings, uh, public transport and biking, energy, waste recycling, etc. You can see uh, on the list. What's often missing is the time frame and perseverance, the flexibility and ad climate adaptation, governance issues, and use of local potentials like renewable energy potentials, 
the indirect impacts of consumption is often missing, like uh, uh, consumer goods and food, so like the footprint analysis. Um, and it's difficult to compare aspects. Um, also, there's no often there is no indicator evolution. So if we have a city ranking and we, it's difficult to get often the data back from these ranking organizations because we have to pay a lot of money for them. So there's no feedback if the indicator they use is right or is useful for us. And often weighing is a black box. It's quite possible that they use the number of green buildings in the city to actually say that the city does better in energy uh, performance than another city. So um, that's, which doesn't make sense in, in many cases. And we found a lot of these issues being dealt with in, well, this Global Cities Indicator Facility, but also European Green Cities, uh, Green Capital helped, Siemens Green City Index. They, I mean, they were all helpful, but we are still looking for a, a, a good level of detail there. So what we uh, actually did, we, uh, we got many questions from ranking systems, but also from BREEAM, LEED, uh, and local assessment tools for areas. And actually, the people who work in the GIS department, well, they actually got a bit crazy because of all the different questions for data. So what we said, we have this question for, let's say, energy. And we now said, well, let's not gather the information just for the city or one big area, but on the smallest pixel possible. As you can see here, well, just imagine they are small pixels. So when there is a new question for this part of the city, we can answer it. But also if there is a question for another part of the city, because we have gathered the information on the smallest pixel possible. So this was a first step in making the lists, the indicators, which are usually just numbers, make them spatial. Uh, and that's what we did. We actually uh, did, used the GCIS indicators but we can use any indicator to actually map it on the city of Rotterdam on a small pixel. So instead of having a number for a neighborhood, for instance, a four for energy in a certain neighborhood, we now have pixels. So we don't, we don't uh, want to know if it's a four in a certain neighborhood. Now we want to know which blocks are doing well and which are doing bad. So what is the two and what is the ten? Uh, so then it helps actually urban planners, or spatial planners, to do something with this information. Well, we just prepared some maps. So I won't go into detail uh, too much on them, but just to show you what we've done with usually what well, are usually just indicator lists in numbers or percentages. Sometimes the outcome of ranking system is if you uh, add 10% more green area to your city, uh, you will improve. Uh, much more. But then the question is, where do you put this green infrastructure? Do you put it near existing parks or make a new network? These are basic questions we try to answer by making these data spatial. So one of the things is that in um, uh, stakeholder meetings, we had these maps on the table, but it didn't work really well with 40 maps on the table. So we provided the kind of interface, like here are all the indicators present we use, and we just showed with a traffic light system which indicators score well in the neighborhood and which score really bad. And this way we had a, a simple tool, and it's used more often these spider diagrams, to actually use in stakeholder uh, uh, um, approaches. So for instance, here we are the government, we have the external stakeholders and the project, and we have then coalitions formed around the project to make actions and to monitor it. But um, now we say, okay, let's put in the resilience profile or the, the, the sustainability profile we've made and um, actually use it in this project so that we have a kind of an information-based system going on. So one of the themes and results out of these was, for instance, that we have the water system in Rotterdam here, which these are the problematic areas. Zooming in on this area, we should actually see that these blocks are the problem. Uh, and we can say, okay, there's a water problem and a recreation shortage, so why not put in a water garden and a water square? So it help, helps us to actually make policy better. The same with energy. We looked at energy use, uh, income level, and uh, energy poverty, and then, okay, what solution goes with it? So this is the way we actually try to use the indicators. Another issue is that, um, for instance, in an open process and decision-making, some uh, people said, well, um, for instance, about densification, you can't densify in a certain area because of noise levels. With this information at the table, we now can say, well, 
it's a wrong uh, conclusion. We should say, look where there's asphalt or cobblestones, because it influences noise levels. Then look if there's traffic or no traffic. What is the speed limit and what are the noise levels which go together with this? And then we can say something about densification. So it gives us the buttons to actually switch and to turn on for decision makers uh, in these processes. So the next step is to go from neighborhood level to city level so that we have actually a tool to see where we can put our money and our effort in the city to uh, where it's needed uh, in a way. So the follow-up is actually, uh, I'll just mention this one, to actually use also new indicators uh, which show also the potential and localized resilience indicators because that is often uh, missing. So a new indicator groups could be about energy, food, and water. Uh, like here, the energy potential mapping uh, of Andy van der Doppelstein, it's now used in the city, but it's not at all in uh, ranking systems because they don't have the feedback, uh, feedback uh, loop yet. But also resilience mapping is something we should uh, uh, take a note of because a resilient city for us is not just a city which deals with floods and drought, but also uh, that it can count on local structures to fall back upon when there is something uh, happening. So that also counts for food, materials, water, but also for traffic, etc. So for instance here, if you have a central energy system and something fails, this will happen. Uh, if you have a more uh, uh, diverse system, uh, this will happen, and you end up with a system which can fall back upon a certain basic local system. So the same you have with dikes in the Netherlands. If one dike breaks, not the whole area of the Randstad is being flooded, but smaller areas, pockets, are actually uh, flooded. So this is a historical thing, but it still makes the area more resilient uh, to flooding. And the same is for energy. We try to do now is that we don't depend on uh, one central uh, big grid system when it fails it and then everything is lost, but actually go into a patchwork of central and decentral so that we have a mix of uh, electricity source, different electricity sources, so towards a mix of energy sources. So in a way, this is what I want to present. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.